Introducing 100 Days of Code with Treehouse. What is 100 Days of Code? It's a long-standing coding challenge created by Alex Calloway, and it's simple. Commit to learning every day for 100 days. The amount that you learn in that short time frame will change your life. Whether you want to level up your skills or jumpstart a new career, commit to the challenge. You'll be shocked by how much you learn and accomplish. You'll have the full support of the Treehouse community of students working with you. We'll be sending you motivational emails, clips from our 100 Days of Code podcast, featuring advice, tips and tricks from developers, and so much more. There's never been a better time to commit to your learning. Join us. Hello, welcome to another edition of Design Q&A. Happy October. <laughs> hope, your do hope your day is going okay. <laughs> I was just trying to figure out my lighting and I found my uh, cat lamp. I thought y'all might enjoy seeing it. It's kind of, it's like super bright, but, um, and the eyes kind of glow, which is kind of creepy, but I think it's, I think it's cute. Um, but yeah, so uh, without further ado, this is just my monthly design Q&A live stream. Thank you all for joining. My name is Hope Armstrong and I'm a senior product designer and UX design teacher at Treehouse. So for folks that aren't familiar with Treehouse, we're the place to go for learning how to design and develop websites and apps. So it's pretty exciting. And if you want to check it out, we actually have a free seven day trial. So just go to team, teamtreehouse.com. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. We do have a moderator who is feeding me questions as I go along. So I definitely want to make sure we're all on the same page and everyone's up to speed with what I'm talking about. So don't be afraid to just ask whatever's on your mind. And it can also just be off topic, um, just anything about design generally I can answer. <laughs> um, but I do have a question from one of our students that was asked before the live stream. So I was able to do a little bit of homework and put some slides together for y'all. So I'm gonna get started with that one. So first question. Uh, can you show us how to use one of the frameworks from uxframeworks.design? Uh, I actually hadn't heard of this site before, so I was curious to check it out. And I was really impressed. I mean, first of all, this is such a beautiful <laughs> color combination. I love this palette. And this actually has a lot of free activities that you can do in your user research. So I definitely found some fresh ideas on here. And I really appreciate a few designers putting this together. And here are the folks behind UX Frameworks. There's Allison Grace, who is a face I recognize from Twitter. She's always posting really good insights on Twitter, basically every day. So she's someone to follow in the UX design world. And um, there's some of her other teammates from Teague, I believe it's pronounced. And I think that's a design agency, so they probably have a lot of experience working with different companies. And so they have all these different activities that they call UX frameworks. And so the one I'm going to show today is the tension web, and the output is actually a hypothesis. So I'll basically be showing these two. And so here's what it looks like. Um, you can see here that they did this on a whiteboard, but I just did this in Figma. Um, it's just much easier. I don't know about y'all, but I don't have a whiteboard in my house. <laughs> and with a lot of folks working from home, I'm guessing y'all don't either. Um, but you could use your wall, uh, at least to put the post-it notes up and run the little pieces of, of tape across to make your lines. But so the idea with the tension web is basically an early stage product idea. Maybe you're a little fuzzy about where, what direction you want to take it. You could design it for 
any number of different audiences. And usually with the early stage product, there's a million things under the sun you could make. But in reality, you probably have a really small team and you have to think really um, smart about how much you want to take on. So often you do like an MVP, a minimum viable product idea, and say you start small and build from there because you can't really build the best product for all the different types of audiences you could build for, if that makes sense. So you really need to narrow down into a very opinionated uh, hypothesis to build your product to a certain audience. Um, I just found this giant ball of cat hair on my hands. It's very real life. <laughs> and so yeah, the input is qualitative research. So this could be user interviews. Um, I've actually just been going through a lot of uh, exit surveys. So when people cancel their account, they write a reason why. So any kind of information like that can go into how you actually do the tension web. And I'm going to get into what it is actually, but the, the whole output that you're trying to drive is a series of hypotheses. And uh, those are basically your assumptions or your guesses on uh, what will happen if you build a certain type of product. And so I figured I would just demo this coming up with a random app idea I have around climate change. Just something personally I'm interested in. Um, so basically people want to prevent climate change, but they don't know how, right? It's like such a big existential problem that's outside of what you and, all, you and I can change by ourselves. So maybe we could build an app that suggests individual um, acts that you can do. Maybe we can promote different nonprofits to support who are already working in this space. There's a lot of really new uh, carbon removal technologies. Some have to do with you know, pulling the carbon from the atmosphere. I think putting it in the soil too. Um, there's all kinds of really cool approaches. And also you could offer rewards, maybe work with different sponsors and offer challenges for um, maybe reducing your electricity consumption. Maybe you could share info about new legislation or politicians to support who are working on climate change mitigations. And so when you think about your problem that you want to solve, think about different categories that have spectrums. So you could have a whole spectrum of different primary users. You can have a spectrum of teaching styles. Sorry, I keep eating my microphone. <laughs> I'm trying to talk with my hands. Uh, you can have different learning formats. And I'll just show an example here. So, because it's important to pick the right kinds of categories. So with primary user, I could have anywhere from a high school student, college student, entry to mid-level professionals, kind of early on in their career. Or I can have folks much more senior in, in, in their careers. But so that's a good way, that's a good category to choose because there's a spectrum of possibilities. But what you don't want to do is something like I have here with content types because all of these things can coexist in the same app very easily. You could easily have tips, stories, and articles in the same product. So it's not an opinion, like it's not as strong of an opinion to say, we're building the tips app, right? <laughs> I mean, unless that was part of your core product idea, like I have seen news apps that kind of follow that vibe where it's, oh, here's just a headline or here's what you need to know in a sentence or two <laughs> instead of reading long lengthy articles. But I think in general, these content types can coexist in the same app. And if you're familiar with the Treehouse app, we have courses and workshops and practice sessions and instruction steps and all those things work in our app all at once. So that wouldn't be a good thing for me to choose if I was thinking about the Treehouse app. 
And so let me just make this bigger for y'all. Display a full size. Okay, so for y'all that are curious, this is actually made in Figma, and I, I hope that you're able to find the link to the slide deck in the presentation. So if you want to explore or even copy it and use the design or use this structure, feel free. Uh, you can use this as a template. And so for my climate change app idea, this is what I have for my tension web categories. So as I said, you know, primary user for teaching style, uh, it could be very flexible. Just drop in the app whenever you have time and just learn a little bit as you go. Maybe you want guided paths. If you're familiar with Treehouse, we do have tracks, which are basically this idea of, hey, if you want to learn uh, HTML and CSS, a little bit of front end web development, then here's our track recommendation, which is our combination of Cor uh, courses and workshops and practice sessions and all that to get you started towards that goal. But it's not structured to the point where, you know, you, in school where you have actual assignments and deadlines and if you don't pass, then you fail and it's much more structured. And then your primary learning preference, maybe the app is mostly text, images, and graphs. Or maybe it's an, a podcast, so it's mostly audio, or it's all videos. Maybe it's a YouTube channel. And I think this is really similar to that one I said to not do, <laughs> is the different content types. But I feel like these are different enough that, like as I said, you could, you could just make a podcast and it's only audio, truly. Or you could make a YouTube channel or it's truly just video. So I think this one's one of those that I think it makes the, it makes the cut. It, it's still enough of a spectrum. And then tone of voice could be very casual or formal. Creative direction, you could have fun with this one because on the left here, we could use a lot of memes and be really kooky and fun. Or maybe you want to be a little more straightforward and have a little fun here or there, but don't not make it too saccharine. Or, you know, some people might think it's doing a disservice or isn't as respectful if it's so kooky when it's such a serious topic. So maybe some folks would prefer it being more serious, as a matter of fact, and maybe that would come off as more trustworthy, like maybe they would trust that we actually had the right facts about climate change. So that would be something interesting to do research on. And then for communication style, do folks want to pair up with someone else who's also interested in doing the sustainability acts? Uh, maybe they could meet with them in a weekly Zoom call or something <laughs> if they don't already have too much Zoom fatigue. Maybe they could text about it. Maybe they could meet in a small group, three to five people. Maybe they actually want to meet, meet in a community. So in a Slack channel, for instance, or a Slack group, what am I trying to say? A Slack. <laughs> Maybe the level of effort could be different. Some folks wanna contribute daily. Maybe some folks wanna just contribute annually on Earth Day. <laughs> and for impact, you could have impact at the individual level. You could switch from plastic to reusable bags at your grocery store when you do your shopping. Maybe you want to work on local legislations. Uh, there was one that Berkeley did recently, switching from gas to electric stovetops in restaurants, all new, all new restaurants, because gas stovetops actually are really bad for air quality and it's burning a fossil fuel. <laughs> so there's things you can do locally that make impact. And then at the corporate level, maybe you want to talk to corporations about their, let's see, their supply chain, maybe reducing the amount of transportation, because then, of course, that pollutes the air and leads to cl climate change. Maybe you want to work at a national level. I know California is trying to enact some um, foodware legislation. 
to reduce single use plastics and that can influence the whole United States to do something similar. <laughs> Although all the states would have to get on board, I guess. And at uh, the global level, which would just be totally mind blowing. It'd be so cool if you could do that, but very difficult. And then for a primary motivation, do you just intrinsically wake up and go, how can I help the earth? I don't know. Maybe you just have that urge and you don't need any external motivation influencing you. Maybe you would really like to have those rewards. Like, as I mentioned, working with sponsors to get different rewards if you do different eco challenges. And so for all those, I put myself in the headspace of a college student, which I would have to do more research on this because I'm very far removed from a college student. It's been an, over 10 years since I was in college. So uh, I'm just taking what I know about that generation, but of course would have to do some more qualitative research on that to know if I'm really, if I know what I'm talking about. Uh, so teaching style, this is just for demos anyway, right? So teaching style, let's say college students maybe like flexible teaching style. They just want to drop in and drop out. They already have a lot of college classes that are really structured, so maybe they don't need more of that. Primary learning preference, let's say video. I've seen some environmentalists that I follow on TikTok, and they're doing these really short, fun, educational videos about different swaps, you know, zero waste swaps. You can switch from your plastic sponge to a sponge or a, a brush, a dish brush made out of sisal and wood, for instance. And so maybe that would catch on to this group of people. And maybe the tone of voice is more casual. Maybe you could do some fun you know, dance it, all the dances on TikTok, and then uh, memes. Maybe that would be more engaging. And then for communication, let's say it's community. Maybe since they are in college, maybe you'd actually want to have a interest group at your college for folks who are interested in sustainability and all you could, all you, all you, you all could talk on Slack and communicate that way. And then for level of effort, I figure weekly was kind of a good in-between, like not too often, not too in often. Annual seems like it's pretty far out with very little opportunities to contribute. And I figure, I mean, I'm just influenced by my own perspective, but when I was in college, we weren't really invested in the local city because everyone or most people moved away from Providence, Rhode Island when they graduated. So I would say it's easier to start at an individual level and then work your way out. So once you work or once you settle down somewhere, then you get more invested in that local community, get more into the local government. I just want to check to see if any questions. All good. <laughs> and then when you get your first job, or you get your job, your first job after school, which might not be your first job, then you can also influence change within that corporation and then so on and so on as you kind of expand your perspective and reach. And so primary motivation, I mean, I really think this is dependent on each person. So this is a tough one. I think it could be a mix of both. So maybe the app could address that. And then, so this is where you get to the tension web part. So you could just connect all the dots and the lines just, you know, match your, your color dot. So with this, I, I chose magenta. So everything's magenta for this person or this persona. And you just draw the lines across all of them to form your tension web. And then now that you have all that, you can refer to that as you write up your hypothesis. So you use this format that they have up here. If we design a community-driven educational app with engaging bite-sized meme-rich videos and a flexible learning format, then college students will be motivated to make individual changes to live more sustainably. 
So you can see I put in those buzzwords from the tension web to form this hypothesis. And then you'll do this again, and you'll do it with you know, your colleagues who are also working on the project. You can also use this for your target audience. So you can do an actual user interview using this as a tool to gather information. So I actually took this template to an air quality scientist, and he actually gave me his feedback from his perspective. So he's a senior to director level professional, and he actually would prefer structured courses with deadlines, uh, primarily video, with a casual tone of voice, and not so fun and irreverent as I'm predicting a college student might want, but more straightforward and more, you know, moderately playful, but still kind of serious, but not so serious that it seems very stiff, I guess. Um, and then also community, weekly level of effort, and he actually wants to affect change at the local level. And he has this internal motivation. I mean, yeah, he already works in this space, so it's obviously already very passionate about it. And so for this one, uh, just put your color dot. In this case, I used orange for the air quality scientist. And you can form your hypothesis based on those keywords from the tension web. So if we design a community-driven educational app with a casual, structured, video-based curriculum, then senior director level professionals will be motivated to influence their local government to be more sustainable. Parentheses, reduce the city's carbon footprint, for example. Yeah, and then so you can combine multiple perspectives in the same diagram, which begins to give you a picture of where they diverge and where they converge. So in this case, both actually liked the videos and casual tone of voice, communities, and weekly level of effort. So you can decide you know, with other folks that you're working um, with on the, the app idea, maybe you can talk to both, or maybe you can create an app that speaks to both of these audiences in these ways, especially if there's a lot of synergy of ideas between different groups. Or if you see that there's really not a lot that they have in common, you can decide to be more opinionated, as I like to say, and fully lean on to, or lean into college students who want this kind of like TikTok-esque Zoom or videos and full of like funny jokes and references to pop culture, which may not do well with other uh, primary users that might be of interest. So yeah, so that's an example of what that looks like. And I'm curious to know if you have any questions. It can be about those UX frameworks. Uh, it can be anything about UX design or design in general. Oh, cool, I have some questions. I am a noob to web development, and I wanted to ask what I should learn first, Riot, JS, or Jenko? I, I don't know. I have no idea what the first one is. I probably mispronounced it. Um, oh, wait, was it edited? Oh, wait, no, I read it wrong. It's Node. I thought it was R and I, but it was an N. Sorry, Node.js. I'm just being classic designer here and not knowing what these, uh, what frameworks to recommend. But I really don't know, and uh, I'm sorry. But yeah, I guess I, I know more about design. I know some HTML and CSS and SAS kind of stuff, but not so much that. But I think we do have some content on Treehouse for those, so maybe start there. Um, 
But I guess there's so many frameworks. I'm always just hearing about new web development frameworks. And I think there's a whole, I guess, argument about which one to use, right? I guess there's a lot of opinions. All right. So next question, also very dev centric. So let's see here. Is it better to build my own server or to rent one to host my website? I've never built a server, so that's really next level and kudos to you for knowing how to do that. Uh, I remember my first website was actually hosted on my friend's computer. So I guess maybe he built his own server because it was so weird. I think his computer had to be on for anyone to visit my website. Um, uh, but yeah, I just, I just pay to have my website hosted and I just use the same hosting company since I was like 16, I actually like mailed cash in for my babysitting money to this random like hosting company in North Carolina. And they, I've just been sticking with them since so I really don't know. Uh, I don't know a lot about the different hosting companies. But yeah, that's what I do. And I also have been playing around with Webflow and I just let them host it too. How would you compare HTML and Angular in terms of efficiency and which one would you use? Oh boy. Uh, well, so with HTML, it's very static. And so there's a point where, especially if you're building some kind of dynamic app, it's you're going to run into the case where you're going to need to be able to swap out content based on different conditionals. And it's just going to get really difficult to actually build an interactive app. Whereas, you know, HTML for maybe a landing page or a marketing site that's much more static, then HTML is fine especially if it's a smaller site. I mean, I use basically HTML and CSS, or I'll, I use SAS as a preprocessor for CSS, but I just use that for my portfolio site. And um, yeah, basically my portfolio site. And Angular, I think, is a JavaScript framework. And so Angular... I've worked on a project where we used Angular, but I am not the expert in Angular because I I played designer and I was working with a front end developer who worked on Angular, and so uh, we used we used Angular. I guess it seems like there's newer frameworks for JavaScript now, so I don't really know, but I I don't think. I would say Angular is more like you're getting into building something more dynamic and HTML is more static. Okay, and then the next question is, which is better, CSS or HTML? Well, <laughs> depends on who you ask. I mean, as a designer, I really love CSS because it actually styles the HTML elements. So as a designer interested in visual design and interactivity and all that, then I'm really interested in styling the components. Because if you were to just use plain HTML, it's just going to look very basic and use the basic browser styling, which isn't very pretty. <laughs> so I love, I love CSS. And if you're interested in CSS, um, it's getting a lot more... Um, dynamic even because there's variables and a lot of things that people were using for, um, we're, we're using SAS for, um, which, you know, SAS is a preprocessor for CSS. So you could basically use SAS to do more like dynamic generation of styling for a website and using like for instance, color variables, you can just define a color variable uh, for, for purple, for instance, and anytime you use purple in your CSS or your SAS, you would be able to actually just write in the variable name. 
so you don't have a million different uh, hex codes for this this color and then you have to update it a million places you can just update the place where you've defined the variable purple so CSS is fun and short and definitely learn SAS although CSS is getting more like SAS as the weeks go on and I actually just listened to a talk that Una Kravitz did for Clarity Design Conference and she was uh, she's a developer advocate at Chrome and so she was talking about all the upcoming things that browsers like Chrome are doing to support more SaaS like capabilities to native CSS which is really really cool. So I don't I guess all that to say you can't I don't think you can really effectively you know do one without the other they work really hand in hand html and css but yeah i love css just because it's more fun and visual so yeah any other questions i'm really having to put on my developer hat y'all are coming at me with the web development questions <laughs> Which is fine. I just sometimes I don't know if you know some of these I'm not the best to ask. Let's give y'all a few more minutes. Uh, I wonder if y'all hear the sirens outside. I hope it's not too loud. Okay, another question. Um, to start out with a, to start out as a beginner, which software is easier, Illustrator or Figma for UI design? Hmm. For UI design, I mean, I I started out, I'm trying to think back, I guess technically I probably used Photoshop in the very beginning and some, I don't know, really old design pro programs, but I started, I basically, the, I think the, generally the earliest phase of my career, I did start out with Illustrator, but that was before we even had Sketch or Figma. So if I was starting now, I would start with Figma. And I think Figma is, they've really simplified the UI to not be so distracting. I think I love, I still love Illustrator and I still use it weekly, but Illustrator is really good for fine control of vector shapes. And so I would use, I, I still use Illustrator to do vector illustrations or vector icons because the tool is super powerful. It's the best in its class for vector control. So if you're doing vector graphics, definitely learn Illustrator. If you want to design logos, Illustrator is the way to go. If you talk to a lot of professional illustrators, they use Illustrator. So but in terms of UI design, Figma is definitely newer and they, it was more so built for UI design. Illustrator has a long history, so it's used for a lot of different things. But Figma, I think it's got this scaled down, or tr what am I trying to say? It's got a, a much more simpler interface and I think it's easier to learn how to use. And there's a lot of different plugins for Figma that you can use to do different things that extend the functionality beyond what Figma can do just by itself. And so there's like gradient generators, there's different ways you can, um, there's one for doing data visualization. So if you wanna do like a bar chart or a donut chart, you can just install the plugin. So plus one to, to Figma. And then another one that our students love to use is Adobe XD, which is also, you know, created for UI design and it's newer and 
It has plugins too, and it has a simplified user interface. So I'm trying to think what else about them. They both have a way to share your file, like share your link and make clickable prototypes, which is also something that Adobe Illustrator is lacking. When I used Illustrator, I had to export all the images to a tool called Envision and then set up the prototype there. But if you use a tool like Figma and Adobe XD, they actually built the prototyping within the app. Okay, and then next question, do you have any UI or design book recommendations? So if you're interested in UI design specifically, so more so visual design, um, I haven't checked this out yet, but there's this site called Refactoring UI, and the person behind that is Steve Schrodinger, Schrodinger? I'm probably forgetting his last name, but it's definitely Steve. And he has a book about refactoring at UI um, or basically like visual design tips. And he has this really neat style where it's like, oh, how would you like to improve your typography? Here, here are 10 tips to improve your typography and UI. And he'll do before where it looks a little off and then he'll do after where he cleaned it up. And then he'll explain what he did to make it look better or to make it more readable. And I just think that's a really cool format. So I haven't read his book. I think he's got like a PDF kind of book that you can download. Uh, I'm trying to think what other books can I recommend? I'm trying to look over at my bookshelf, which is books on the floor. <laughs> uh, for UI design, I don't know. There's this book. There's this book about Debbie, Mil Debbie Millman's work. I guess that's more of like branding design, but I think there's a lot of inspiration that you can get from traditional graphic design and trying to get that, that style or that layout that you see in print on the web. I think that's really fun. Definitely check out Jen Simmons' work if you're interested in that. She works at Apple, and I believe her title is something like developer relations or something because she actually works on improving the inspect tool and all the information about like dev tools if you're using safari so i think she's a good resource for css and sas in general um i guess that gets more into coding land um Trying to think of what else. There's Don't Make Me Think if you're interested in more UX kind of stuff. Um, but you said UI or design. Yeah, I don't know. I think I mainly, these days, I've just been <clears throat> following different designers on Twitter and seeing what they post and like reading random Medium articles. And so I feel like there's less books that I refer to on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just more like random links coming in. Um, so yeah, another question is, do I need to be great at math to be good at web development? And this was actually something that I ran into early on in my career too, and it dissuaded me from even trying to get into the field, because I also thought you had to be good at web development <laughs> or you had to be good at math to be good at web development. And actually when I had my first, well, I guess technically my second job after college, I was working at Carnegie Mellon University and we had free courses that we could take because we were working or as staff, we could take free courses. And I actually took a, a quantitative methods class because it was a math class and I had gone to art school, so I hadn't taken math since junior year of high school. So I took the math class because I thought it would help me. <laughs> and it was basically a middle school math teacher that was teaching this college course. And she just said straight up, like, I'm just teaching y'all what I teach the middle schoolers. <laughs> um, so I guess it was a good review, but I still haven't used it to this day. And... Uh, so I don't know. I, 
I don't, I haven't found, found myself using math, even though I code a lot, uh, or I code relatively often for a designer. Uh, but I did take at Carnegie Mellon University, CMU, I took a, a class on um, game development. And that one got really into math. I think it had to do with like plotting where the different characters would end up on the screen. And they were drawing these really complicated math equations on the board and I, it totally went over my head. So I guess maybe in some technologies and applications you do need to know more math, but um, I just, I left that class because it was above my head because there was too much math. So I guess your experience may vary, but just in terms of designing for the web, I have not come into very much math. But again, I'm working more with HTML, CSS, a little bit of JavaScript. So not so much plotting things on the screen, like in a, in a gaming sense. Whereas I guess with gaming, you're thinking about like collision and some physics that's kind of involved there. So it gets more complicated in the math land. All right, this is last question. Thank you all for so many questions. I think this is the most I've gotten in one of these live streams. Hi, I am currently searching for a UI designer slash developer role. What languages would you recommend me learning first? Yeah, so definitely HTML and CSS and SAS would be a plus. Although, I mean, I think it would be a huge plus. And once you, I feel like once you learn SAS, it's kind of hard to not write SAS. It's hard to go back to CSS, I mean. And then some kind of JavaScript framework. And I don't know which one to recommend, as, as I was saying before. But if you look at job descriptions, you can see like which ones that they expect you to know. And I know that there is a debate about like which JavaScript framework to use because there's React and Angular and probably a bunch of other ones, I don't know. And so refer to the debates in a community near you <laughs> for those. And then, yeah, I mean, this isn't a language, but of course, just getting familiar with Get and GitHub on like working in terminal to use get. Uh, I think there's definitely a big learning curve there. I still have to look things up when I'm pushing my code to, to GitHub and like I commit something and then I'm like, oh darn, I got to uncommit it. That's always a challenge. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think if you, yeah, if you're working more on the front end side of things, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are the way to go. And there are some roles that use PHP. I actually worked with a little bit of PHP, creating my own WordPress theme earlier on in my career, because uh, I have had a couple sites that are WordPress based. So under the hood, WordPress is PHP. So you might want to learn that as opposed to JavaScript or in addition to JavaScript, it just depends on what your companies or what your prospective employers are using. And then at Treehouse, I've picked up a little bit of Ruby on Rails because our app is built on that. So, I mean, there are certain things like that. I mean, not every product is built on Ruby on Rails, although it is a popular one. So there's things like that. You're just going to pick up on the job too. So I don't think you're necessarily expected to know everything. And then I'm trying to think, there's some documentation I've made, like design systems documentation that I've used, um, Jekyll, which is this like static web page builder tool. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of random stuff. There's some of our code is in CoffeeScript, which is similar to JavaScript. Yeah, that's all I got. I guess that's plenty, right? <laughs> I would say HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are number one, though. Alrighty. Well, thanks, y'all, for joining me. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And take care. I'll see you.